Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGangi reporting for the media speaks. Only going to be able to do high def today. Uh, the opposite problem was normal. Uh, same reason as always. Gear sucks. Unfortunately, but you know what's great? The reporting, the facts, the news. Because whatever I give you, you know that you can count on. And I love when I get these morons on my site that want to go ahead and, oh, he's got long hair, or oh, he's got tattoos, so he doesn't know what he's talking about. The point is, they can attack me, which I don't care. Do I look like someone that cares? However, they can attack the facts that are given here. Why? Because the correct views gives facts. That's why I'm asking you that like the truth, those of you that love the truth, to share my work. Share it far and wide. The, fan, uh, the listenership, I should say, grows daily. Daily. More viewers every day than there were before. So keep sharing what we do because we're out here to make a difference. And uh, like I said, the way we do that's simply by getting the truth out. And this is a really long article. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's from the New York Times, though. You can look it up. The secret casualties of Iraq's abandoned chemical weapons. Um, basically, uh, I'll read you one of the stories, and then I'll get into exactly what's happening here. Because, again, it's an extremely long article. The soldiers at the blast crater sensed that something was wrong. It was August 2008, near Taji, Iraq. They had just exploded a stock of old Iraqi military shells buried beside a murky lake. The blast, part of an effort to destroy munitions that could be used in makeshift bombs, uncovered more shells. Two technicians assigned to dispose of munitions stepped into the hole. Later, water seeped in. One of them, Specialist Andrew T. Goldman, noticed a pungent odor of something he said he had never smelled before. He lifted the shell, oily paste oozed from a crack that doesn't look like pond water, said his team leader, Staff Sergeant Eric Drooling. Uh, the specialist swabbed the shell with a chemical detection paper. It turned red, and it indicated sulfur mustard. And there's many reports of uh, different agents getting on to our um, soldiers, getting into our soldiers' systems, and it was hidden. We found a whole lot of WMD in Iraq, just like Bush said we would. Am I saying Bush was a great president? No. I'm saying that Bush did not lie about the weapons of mass destruction. He didn't. Do you know why he didn't uh, show the whole world this? Do you want to know why he's trying to hide the soldiers being poisoned from it? Because you would think, anybody with a thinking part of their brain working, that is, would think, that he would be out there showing everybody this news, saying, hey, look at me, I was right. Well, that would be true if they weren't made in part by the United States. You see, what's happened, and I'm cutting to the chase of this story, but for those of you, yet the long-haired guy doesn't give any sources, read the article before you leave, just comment and make an ass out of yourself. Um, we helped make them. Why? Because we were funding one side of the conflict, which was the side that was... Uh, against Iran. We were funding Iraq. And then Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and did a number of other really nasty things, and we had financial interests there. Again, I'm not saying any of this is good or bad. It's just true. And when Saddam Hussein went insane, we told him to destroy the weapons that we had given him. He didn't. And he got his ass hung. Why? Because he should have gotten rid of the weapons! However, we should have never given it to them at the same time. So, I mean, this notion that we made the weapons, and I hear people say this all the time, that we made the weapons knowing exactly what was going to No, we didn't. And again, we funded uh, the Taliban against Russia. I've said this many times. I'm not saying it was a good idea. I'm going to ask you a question, though. What if communism had won? We wouldn't be dealing with uh, a lot of the terrorist issues we have today because we wouldn't have funded these bastards. But let me ask you something. Would the world have been all that much of a better place if the communists had won? I don't know. Who knows? No one's got the crystal ball to say that. But the point is, there were weapons of mass destruction that they couldn't find that we knew were there. Well, now we know why we knew they were there. Our government helped make them. And that is a black eye that the administration doesn't want. It would be the Bush administration. 
But because, again, remember, uh, the Bush family was part of the Reagan administration when much of this happened. We made the weapons. And now, I mean, look what it's done. The other great lie in this, of course, is that there were no Al-Qaeda in Iraq before we got there. That's BS. Musab al-Zakawi was there. He was beheading people, and Saddam Hussein was giving him safe haven as we were searching for him, for beheading our reporters. So don't tell me that there weren't any there. Now, again, was it a good idea that we went storming into Iraq like we did? Obviously not. Largely because even if you could argue the war was a good idea, we had the worst administration running a war you could ever have up until Obama, which is the worst probably of all time. But, you know... They did a miserable job. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, and we, I'm not saying, it's proven. Lots of people are saying now that it's fact, a proven fact, I should say, that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Guys, eagnews.org, school district institutes drug testing policy for seventh graders, but not employees. Whatever happened to the days when they taught the Constitution that you have a Fourth Amendment right to not have to go through these sorts of things? They must not have ever heard about it here in Graveport, Ohio. Um, parents of students in Graveport Madison schools are posing a simple question about the district's new random drug testing policy for students. If the students are tested for drugs, then why not the teachers? Amen! What's good for the goose is good for the freaking gonder. If you don't like your medical information out there, if you don't like your rights violated, then don't do it to the students. District officials, however, have refused to discuss the drug, drug testing policy with local media stations and instead issued a lame reasoning for the new random drug testing policy implemented this year for all students 7th grade and above who want to participate in extracurricular activities, 10tvnews.com reports. Well, Sam, they do it in the NFL. It should be illegal there, too. Now, I don't care if they're testing for performance-enhancing drugs, but you can also argue that uh, if performance-enhancing drugs are the only thing that can make you successful, then, I mean, you're never going to completely get them out of there. But I really don't have a problem with testing for those as much as I do the other substances. The policy, according to a school statement, is to provide for the safety of all students and to undermine the effects of peer pressure by providing a legitimate reason for students to refuse to use alcohol or illicit substances. Well, right, well, why isn't it the sentence say the policy, according to school statement, is to provide the safety for all teachers and to undermine the effects of peer pressure by providing, well, why doesn't it say that? Why are the teachers exempt? An incorrect view. Parents Sonja Brown and Tracy Collins believe the new policy sets a double standard for students and forces them to consent to an unnecessary intrusion of privacy in order for their children to participate in school activities. And I agree. Why? Because it's the truth. The district apparently started random drug testing for high school students last year and extended it to 7th grade students now. Um, the parents of Sonia Brown and Tracy Collins believe, oh, I'm sorry, I read that one. The principal said that he's, she's trying to hold these kids to a higher standard. Why don't you hold your teachers to a higher standard? I don't have a choice but to sign it, Collins said. He only has to practice 90 minutes a week. Uh, you know what? Let me tell you what. There are places that you can play that do not involve junior high school. There are other schools you could put your kids into. You might want to look into doing that. How can you fight this, guys? Go to Graveport's uh, school district and fight it. I can't send a dunce cap to everybody. I don't have the money to do it. But I'll tell you what, um, I mail one out every month, the dunce cap of the month award, and then I give you idiots all month long, and I let you guys decide how you're going to deal with them. Guys, the last thing I'm going to get to before the massive Ebola update that is coming up next, I was going to put this in the Fukushima update, but I'm not entirely sure that this is Fukushima related, but it might be. But we don't want to go ahead and put ourselves in a situation where we're saying that every little thing that comes up is somehow Fukushima related. Because if you do that, you're going to be wrong and you're going to take away from the importance that is how bad uh, the disaster is which I agree wholeheartedly with Dr. Chris Busby. It is the worst disaster in all of recorded history. The local.no. 
radioactivity in Norway's reindeers hits high. And if you ever saw him, you would even say it glows. Well, now we know why that nose glows, don't we? Much higher levels of radioactivity than normal have been found among Norway's grazing animals, especially its reindeer population, a study revealed Monday. Does anybody with a little more knowledge, because they're not going to say it's Fukushima, so we can't count on the authorities to be honest about this, but does anybody who has some kind of um, background in the dissipation of water and rain and the uh, jet stream, can you tell me whether or not this could be Fukushima related? Because this is exactly what we're finding in grazing animals uh, from Fukushima eastward, all the way to the U.S., of course, but I don't know. It looks like it might be something that's happening uh, near from Chernobyl. But, again, everyone's going to say, well, there you go, it was Chernobyl. Well, why is it spiking so much this year? Does it have to do with the rains? I don't know. But I can tell you this. It has to do with the fact that mankind should not, under any circumstances, be building nuclear power plants. How do you stop that? You fight back by not uh, investing in them, by pulling out of mutual funds, by pulling out of stocks from GE, from all of the Westinghouse places, the build nuclear power plants should never get your money. And if they do, you're part of the problem. Almost 30 years after the nuclear plant explosion in Chernobyl, this autumn, more radioactivity has been measured in Norwegian grazing animals than has been noted in many years. And again, it happened in 1986, but for these elements that last millions of years, like uh, plutonium, it wasn't even yesterday. Lavrand sc scootered a scientist at the Norwegian Radiation Protection Authority, S-K-U-T-E-R-U-D, said this year is extreme. In September, 8,200 becquerel per kilo of radioactive substance cesium-137 was measured in reindeer from Vega Renlog Os in Jotunheim, J-O-T-U-N-H-I-E-M, in central Norway. In comparison, the highest amounts at the same place was 1,500 becquerel among the reindeer in September 2012. Again, refresher, becquerel, for those of you that may forget, is one nuclear explosion happening inside of your body, or in this case, the body of the reindeer. And every single one of those explosions can create a uh, cancer, can create a heart problem, can create a brain tumor, etc., etc. The research also measured, also measured radioactivity in Norwegian sheep this year, both in Valdres in southwest Norway and Gouda Brandsleden in northeast Norway, 4,500 becquerel per kilo meat from sheep. So again, avoid sheep, avoid, um, obviously avoid reindeer. Do you eat reindeer? Avoid reindeer if it comes from Norway. Uh, look at your packages. If it doesn't say where it comes from, don't buy it. 600 becquerel per kilo is the safe limit allowed for sheep meat or sold for human consumption. Let me ask you something. Do you want 600 nuclear uh, radiation explosions going off inside your body every second for the rest of your life to give you cancer? Probably not. The radiation protection scientist is quite certain about the cause. Quite, yeah, he said this year there's been an extreme amounts of mushroom. In addition, the mushroom season has lasted for a long time and the mushroom has grown very high in the mountains. So basically, they're saying that it is, uh, and again, never eat mushrooms, uh, especially after, uh, after Fukushima, because they soak up the radiation. They're very good for bringing up ground radiation to some degree. But if you eat them, and I love them, but I don't eat them very often now, almost never, because they're toxic. They will harm your health if you eat mushrooms. This is not opinion, that is fact. It said, especially the gypsy mushroom, if you're a fan of that, has been a problem. This is a good food mushroom, both for people and animals, but it has one bad trait. It absorbs a lot of radioactivity. That's not good for human consumption, then, is it, you damn bonehead? The Chernobyl happened in 86. Well, that's nothing. And like I said, that's absolutely nothing. The half-life is 30 years, but it wasn't just cesium. Let's remember plutonium, which goes on for millions of years. Friends, we're going to get into the Ebola update in just a second, but I want to remind you that uh, you can go to the Seacrest Motel at Cedar Point. It's almost Halloween. After that weekend, bam, after the 1st of November, no more Cedar Point all the way to May. Because it's freezing, it's snowing. You want to go up there, don't you? You want to see the haunted houses, don't you? You're going to want to stay at the Seacrest Motel when you do. Tell Vicky that you heard about them from TCV, the correct views. Tell them Sam sent you. 
you're going to get a room at a fraction of the price that anybody else staying at any of the other hotels are getting. Do I mean Red Roof Inn? Do I mean Mo Super Super 8, Motel 6? I mean that. That's exactly what I mean. But I also mean if you're going to stay at the Hotel Breakers, which starts at 150 and goes up to $600, you'd better be rich. Or maybe you should just travel, get a comfy bed, get a beautiful room, get a nice clean room, good bathroom, Seacrest Motel for a fraction of the cost. Guys, we're going to go right into the Ebola news as promised. I didn't lead with this because we haven't had an outbreak in five days in the U.S., which is good. I hope it's a sign that we are winning rather than the incubation period is still going on, which, again, it's going to be doing for quite some time. But what I can do is tell you this. I can give you all of the most up-to-date Ebola news that I have this far, and that also includes the dum of the day coming at the end. So don't zone out. Your life may depend on this. Um, NBC News, this segment brought to you by Mike McLaughlin, who writes some of the best fiction extant today. Go to Facebook.com and look up the work of Mike McLaughlin and tell him you heard about it from the correct views. Who declares Nigeria Ebola-free after 42 days with no cases? Good news here. We don't have a lot of good news on the Ebola front, but this is one of them. Abuja, the World Health Organization, declared Nigeria Ebola-free on Monday after the 42-day period with no new cases, a success story with lessons for countries still struggling to contain the deadly virus. Nigeria is now free of Ebola, who Representative Rui Gama Vaz told a news conference in the capital, Abuja, prompting a round of applause from other officials. This is a spectacular success story. But we must be clear that we have only won the battle. The war will only end when West Africa is also declared Ebola-free. Uh, again, I hope they're honest if it was to come back in their uh, area. I hope they'll just try to hide it. Um, it says, The first case in Nigeria, Africa's most populous nation, was imported from Liberia when a Liberian-American diplomat called Patrick Sawyer, and we interviewed DeConte Sawyer. Look up DeConte Sawyer, Media Speaks, his uh, widow. Very strong woman. It says he collapsed at the main international airport in Lagos on July 20th. Because the country was ill-prepared and had no screening procedures in place, Sawyer was able to infect several people, including several health workers in the hospital where he was taken. Let me remind you that it's not normally found in West Africa, but can I ask you why they all of Africa, especially larger places like airports, weren't already prepared for this? Knowing that it's been in their country, it comes from their country. Then again, as we know, I've mentioned this in the last update, they think it may have been what wiped out ancient Greece and Athens. Uh, half, half of Athens died from a disease, including hiccups and the chronic hiccups, not just you know the ones you laugh at. Eyes bleeding, diarrhea, all the pleasantries uh, that you hear of now. Very likely wiped out half of Athens, uh, ancient Athens. So for those of you that think it was created by the government, you're a bonehead. It might have been manipulated by the government, but it was not created by any government. Ebola has killed 4,546 people across Liberia. Guinea and Sierra Leone are the three worst affected countries, of course. 20 cases in total, eight of which died. Very, very uh, sobering news there. We have on, on Infowars.com, top scientists, the version of Ebola looks like a very different bug. I'm sorry, it's posted on Infowars. It's actually Michael Snyder, Economic Collapse. How many of you are angry enough to kick a kitten through a house fan if one more stupid SOB tries to tell you that Ebola isn't airborne? We know from the study from Dr. Peters that it can, in fact, be airborne. So please quit saying it. Please quit blaming Rand Paul for being honest and saying that you might be able to catch it within three feet of somebody because he was telling the truth. No matter what the DNC wants you to believe. Barack Obama and the head of the CDC need to quit saying that we know exactly how Ebola spreads because the truth is that there is much about this virus that we simply do not know. For example... A top Ebola scientist that is working in the heart of the outbreak in Liberia says that this version of Ebola looks like it could be a very different bug from past versions. Other leading scientists are echoing his concerns, and yet Barack Obama and Thomas Frieden continue to publicly proclaim that we know precisely how this virus behaves. 
That's not only bad science, but it could also potentially result in unnecessary deaths of a large number of people. For example, Obama has refused to implement an Ebola travel ban because he is greatly underestimating the seriousness of the virus. This decision could turn out to be incredibly costly. Uh, yeah, as in human life kind of costly. Peter Jarling of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease is on the front lines fighting this disease in Liberia. He is one of the top authorities in the world, so don't tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about because I do. And what his team has been seeing under the microscope is sobering, incredibly so. Now U.S. scientist Peter Jarling of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases believes the current outbreak may be caused by an infection that spreads more easily than before. He explained to his, that his team who are working on the epicenter of the crisis in Liberia are seeing that viral loads, that's how much Ebola in layman's terms, of patients are seeing much higher than they are used to be seeing. He told Vox.com, we are using tests now that we weren't using in the past. So they're giving you data based on old testing methods, and you boneheads are believing it. We are using tests now that weren't using in the past, but there seems to be the belief that the virus load is higher in these patients today than what we've seen prior. If true, that's, very, that's a very different bug. I have field tests in Monrovia. They are running tests. They are telling me that the viral loads are coming up very quickly and very high, higher than they're used to seeing. It may be that the virus burns out hotter and quicker. For John Rappaport, whose dumbass is out there saying that uh, it's not a real disease, they don't really test for it. I've lost all respect for him. I really all lost all respect. Don't even bother reading John Rappaport. You line your birdcage with his articles. Other top scientists are making similar observations. The following comes from a recent Washington's blog post. The head of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Michael Osterholm, is a prominent public health scientist and nationally recognized biosecurity export, expert. More sources. Dr. Osterholm just gave a talk on C-SPAN explaining that the top Ebola biologist and head of the special pathogens at Canada's health agency, Gary Cobbinger, has found that the current strain of Ebola appears to be much worse than any strain that they have seen before, and that this current virus may be more likely to spread through aerosols, that is, airborne, than strains which scientists have previously encountered. This was also on C-SPAN. And again, we've talked about this. Even if it is the exact same strain of Ebola, there are other people telling us that we've known about this since 1989. Dr. C.J. Peters, who I'm now quoting for the fourth time, for you boneheads, and I'm not talking about my regular listeners, I love you. I'm talking about these stupid asses on my site that are leaving this ridiculous information on my comment line steering people towards articles that are written by people using data that is older than 1989. Well, I'm giving you data from the cutting edge of 2014. How's that? I win. Dr. C.J. Peters, who battled a 1989 outbreak of the virus among research monkeys housed in Virginia and who later led the CDC's far-reaching study of Ebola's transmissibility in humans, said he would not rule out the possibility that it spreads through the air in tight corridors. What, you mean like a hut? You mean like a hospital room? Yes. We just don't have the data to exclude it, said Peters in 1989, who continues to research viral diseases at the University of Texas in Galveston. So he's still working. That means that uh, he's not, uh, he hasn't been thrown out for his fraudulent work because it was true. Dr. Philip K. Russell, another one, a biologist who oversaw Ebola research while heading to the U.S. Army's Medical Research and Develop Command, who later led the government's massive stockpiling of the smallpox vaccine after September 11th, said much was still to be learned. Being dogmatic is, I think, advised because there are too many unknowns. Yeah, what kind of unknowns? 
Oh, how about back in 2012? Demonstrated that the Ebola virus can be transferred to one animal to another animal without any physical contact. Without physical contact. Breathing. <sighs> For you boneheads. When news broke that the Ebola virus had resurfaced in Uganda, investigators in Canada were making headlines of their own with research indicating the deadly virus was spread between species through the air. The team, comprised from researchers at the National Center for Foreign Animal Disease, the University of Manitoba, and the Public Health Agency of Canada, observed transmission of Ebola from pigs to monkeys. The first inoculated a number of piglets with the Zaire strain of Ebola virus. The Ebola Zaire is the deadliest strain. Pause. Don't give me the BS. The people can't get it. It's the same strain that wipes us out. So don't, don't give me that BS either because it's wrong. The piglets were then placed in a room with four Synmongolus max, a species of monkey commonly used in laboratories. The animals were separated by wire cages to prevent contact between the species. Again, they could have sneezed, they could have coughed. Sneezing and coughing happened to come with Ebola. Airborne! Within a few days, the inoculated piglets showed clinical signs of infection indicative of Ebola. In pigs, Ebola generally causes respiratory illness and increased temperature. Nine days after infection, all piggies appeared to have recovered from the disease. Within eight days of exposure, two of the four monkeys showed signs of Ebola infection four days later. The remaining two monkeys were sick too. It is possible that the first two monkeys infected the other two, yes, but transmission between non-human primates has never been observed in a lab before. So when Obama and Thomas Frieden tell you that they know 100% certainty that it's not airborne. They are lying to you. Guys, uh, I'm going to go ahead. Don't zone out. There are uh, actually four more stories left in the Ebola update. I'm going to switch data cards and post this as a two-part, but you will not be missing anything. Same name, just click on the very next video. There's four more stories in this update.